Thank you so much, Fazi. Uh, thanks for so much. And I just wrote uh, the book called Death the Life of the Great American School System. And I credit to you with having an enormous impact on my thinking. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, I just want to be sure. It's, uh, I have never been to Hawaii, so I'm doubly sorry that I'm not here with you today. And I hope I'll have another chance to visit. You're very lucky to have the Education Institute to advocate for you and for better public schools and for your teachers. Uh, that's terribly important. A lot of, a lot of states don't have uh, I'm going to speak with you today about what I call the hoaxes of the privatization movement, uh, because this is what's happening in most of the United States, not necessarily in Hawaii, but throughout the rest of the country. There is a very avid movement to privatize public education. Uh, and it's built a series of uh, misstatements, errors, uh, the word that I would use would be prevarications, but I could have used a shorter word, but I'll just call it prevarication. <laughs> uh, first is the, the claim that we hear again and again, that you know, the education of the U.S. is failing, that it's declining, that we're falling behind other nations, and that we're in an education crisis. And I maintain that we are in an education crisis, but it is, it is the one manufactured by people who call themselves reformers. Very few of whom have ever been a teacher, or even a parent or a student in a public school. Uh, secondly, is the claim made by reformers over and over again that bad teachers cause low test scores, and that if we get rid of the teachers, the test scores will soar and the achievement gaps will close. Uh, there's an economist at Stanford University, Eric Anushek, uh, who argues that if we fired 5 to 10 percent of our teachers every year based on test scores, the economy would grow by trillions and trillions of dollars. I have no idea how he came up with that, but uh, he's never explained. Uh, then there are the matter of the there's a matter of the international test scores about which we hear constantly uh, from politicians and pundits. They say, well, we're number 27 or 28 or 18 or whatever it is. And they say our economy is going to be ruined by our public schools because we don't have higher test scores, the PISA exam or the TEMS exam. The most important thing you should know about these exams is that they do not predict the future. This test scores of 15-year-olds have no connection to the economy uh, 20 or 30 years from today. Uh, in 1964, the United States participated in the first international test, it was a test of mathematics, and there were 12 nations who took that test. Our seniors came in last, 50 years ago. Uh, for the last 50 years, we have done poorly on international tests, either in the bottom quarter or no better than average, but our economy has nonetheless outperformed all the nations that had higher test scores. We have the biggest economy, the most powerful military, a dynamic culture, and our test scores did not prevent our success. Uh, the test scores are important in some fashion, uh, perhaps as a, a gauge of whether we're making progress or not making progress, but they may also reflect how much time is spent on test preparation. Uh, and I think that that's not something that anyone should boast about. Now, the reformers also tell us that poverty doesn't matter and that poverty is just an excuse for bad, pe uh, bad teachers. Um, but that's a ridiculous idea. Poverty matters enormously. Uh, in fact, social scientists have for the last, not just the last generation, but for many generations, established that there is a very close correlation and even a causal relation between poverty and uh, test performance. The crisis talk is meant to persuade the public to accept anything that the reformers propose, even though the reformers have no evidence. Uh, they create a sense of panic that our public schools are failing, and it becomes almost customary to pick up the newspaper and see a column about our failing public schools. They are not failing. Now, I'll give the data on that in a minute, but there is a hidden goal behind this crisis talk and this constant finger-pointing and blaming of teachers in schools. By constantly shifting blame to schools and to teachers, 
reformers, so many of whom are in the 1% in terms of income and, and wealth, the reformers distract attention from the real problems of our society, and that is growing wealth inequality, growing income inequality, crumbling infrastructure, and a shrinking and increasingly angry middle class. People are angry, and so reformers, especially the billionaires and the hedge fund managers, would prefer to talk about the schools rather than it diverts the public's attention. So their goals are, first of all, a free market of school choice, eliminating public schools wherever possible, eliminating local school boards, and eliminating democratic control. They particularly like state takeovers and um, any, any kind of thing that it hands control of the schools over to um, either the governor or some private entity, but not uh, to the populace. A second of their goals is to kill teachers' unions and to replace experienced teachers with newcomers like Teach for America, who won't stay long enough to collect attention. That's supposed to save money. And this is why the reformers are promoting court cases to eliminate tenure and to weaken labor unions. One case is now in the courts of California, it's called Vergara, and it would eliminate tenure. And the other case is before the Supreme Court, it's called Friedrichs. And the purpose of Friedrichs is to say that people who don't want to pay union dues don't have to pay union dues, but get all the benefits. Uh, and this has been obviously to cripple the, the unions. It has nothing to do with union political activities because an earlier position said that no one's required to pay for the political activities of the unions. It uh, really is a question of whether people can drop out of the union and still collect both benefits. And that's what the uh, uh, Koch brothers and others were backing this court case would like to see happen. Now, the facts are these, as I've given you the claims and the myths and the hopes. The facts is, is that United States education is not failing and it's not declining. The only measure we have of test scores, academic performance over time is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. I was on the NAEP board for seven years, and I know that measure very well, its strengths as well as its weaknesses. Uh, test scores have never been higher than they are today. Uh, NAEP scores have been going up steadily since the uh, NAEP test began in 1970, uh, and they reached a peak and flattened out Actually, the, the progress in the test scores slowed down with the adoption of No Child Left Behind, and the scores, which had been rising steadily, came to a screeching halt just this year. When the NAEP scores were released, it was a shock because we had the combination of No Child Left Behind, Race to the Top, and now the Common Core. And for the first time, scores either went flat across the country, both math and reading. So, we are not suffering from falling achievement. We have had rising achievement from the 1970s right up to uh, this year. Uh, second of all, high school graduation rates have never been higher than they are today. And the way they report the graduation rate these days is engineered to make them look lower than they really are. Because there was an agreement in Washington to only count the four-year graduation rate so that students who graduated in August are students who took five years or students who got a GED are not considered high school graduates. But if you look at the census data, as I did, it turns out that we already have a 90% graduation rate and it's the highest we've ever had. And that's true for white students, Asian students, black students, and Hispanic students. So we do not have a graduation crisis. We're actually doing quite well in terms of the graduation rate. Yeah piece of this is that the dropout rate is now the lowest that it's ever been in history. Now, you would think that our uh, leaders and, and, and uh, president of the Secretary of Education be talking about great success of schools, uh, but instead they have been part of the chorus of uh, any, many, the sky is falling and our schools are terrible. What we do find is that there are communities in crisis and there are very low scores, lower scores, and lower graduation rates wherever there are high levels of poverty and racial segregation. Now, the reformers will say, uh, when they see, they, they don't look at these facts and they don't even admit them, but as they continue their claims that we're in crisis and, and we're declining, uh, they earnestly see that the private sector does everything better. 
uh, and so in state after state, pushed to a large degree by Dutch all behind, and also our race at the top. Uh, there, there's been an explosion of school choice, of charter schools, of chains, of corporate chains of charters, and also vouchers. Uh, now close to half the states in the country have some form of voucher. And there is nowhere in the country where vouchers have ever proved to be uh, educationally more effective than public schools. Uh, the latest report of vouchers came from Louisiana and said that when kids went to voucher schools, they actually lost ground. Uh, the facts and evidence doesn't seem to make a difference. The private sector doesn't do it better. Uh, the only time it does it better is when there are private schools that select students from high-income homes and who, who uh, start like, on third base. Uh, and those schools do very well indeed because they're, they're, they choose their students carefully. Now, No Child Left Behind was a hoax from the very start. Uh, when it was introduced, it was called, it was based on what was called the Texas Miracle. Uh, the second go uh, governor, the seventh, second President Bush, George W. Bush, claimed there had been a miracle in Texas. He said that the graduation rates had gone up, the achievement gap was closing, and this was all because of testing and accountability. And the basic theory behind the Texas Miracle was that if the federal government wielded enough carrots and sticks, if they offered bonuses through merit pay, if they had sticks, uh, punishing teachers, uh, punishing schools, closing schools, this fear would motivate teachers and students to work harder and get higher test scores. Um, actually, it, the, the Texas miracle was a, ho a hoax from the first beginning. I mean, Texas didn't see any of the improvements. They just saw a lot of dropping out going on and then said that uh, their improvements were based on their dropouts. But if we look at NAEP over the years since George W. Bush was elected president, uh, we don't see a miracle. But that's what No Child Left Behind was based on, was that teachers needed uh, uh, carrots and sticks and the students who would respond to, to uh, the test and, and try harder if they, had to, if they were held accountable. So No Child Left Behind included this absolutely absurd goal that 100 percent <coughs> had to be proficient by the year 2014. Uh, now, you may know that there's no nation in the world where 100% children are proficient. Uh, so that was nonsense from the beginning. And no one in Washington actually believed it. Uh, I remember going to a conference at a Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., and hearing a group of senators talk about No Child Left Behind, which they had just passed. And one of the senators was Lamar Alexander, who's now head of the Education Committee in the Senate. And he had been my boss when I worked for the first president. So uh, after they presented their discussion of what was in No Child Left Behind and how it would work, uh, I got up and asked a question. And I said, Senator Alexander, do you really believe that 100% of children will be proficient by 2014? And he responded, uh, no, we don't believe that. We just think it's the damn goals. <laughs> well, to have the goal is an impossible goal. And then punish people when they can't reach the impossible goal is cruel. Uh, no one expected that goal to be met, and yet that goal was used to close schools, our teachers, our principals, and it was ridiculous and punitive. Uh, no Child Left Behind should have been revised in 2007 by Congress, but Congress couldn't agree on what to do. The reality is that Congress became obsessed with accountability. Once accountability got into the law, it's like some kind of uh, addictive substance or addictive idea, and it became impossible for Congress to think of any other way to write a federal law other than to demand more testing and more accountability. Uh, when President Obama was elected in 2008, most people thought that he would overhaul no child left behind, uh, but instead, we got race to the top. Uh, Hawaii has the misfortune of winning race to the top. I'm very sorry. <laughs> race to the top is no different from no child left behind. Uh, the goal of race to the top was that we would somehow, by uh, pressuring everybody and threatening everybody and punishing everybody, get the highest test scores in the world. Uh, this is a very primitive view of human motivation. 
Uh, you have to go back to the early 20th, early 20th century when there was a, a man named Frederick Winslow Taylor who developed idea, uh, theories about social efficiency. And he believed that with uh, punishments and rewards, you could motivate the workforce to produce more. Uh, well, it doesn't work. Uh, and that's not what 21st century cognitive psychologists believe. Uh, people like Dan Ariely, who wrote a book called Predictably Irrational, uh, Edward Detchy, who wrote a book called uh, Why We Do What We Do, and Dan Pink, who summarized the work of Ariely and uh, also Detchy, have said that people are motivated by idealism. They're motivated by a sense of wanting to make a difference, by having autonomy to do what's right, uh, by professional ethics. These are the factors that motivate people, not whips and chains and carrots and sticks. But so we got race top, and its goal was to have the highest test scores in the world, which was frankly ridiculous. Not you know, not everybody wants to have the highest scores in the world, but only one nation wins. Uh, and it's just not a good goal. The goal of, edu of American education is supposed to be equality of educational opportunity, not the highest test scores in the world. And frankly, we can never improve test scores unless we reduce child poverty because of the relationship between poverty and test scores. But reformers persuaded Congress and the media that standardized testing is the best way to measure students, teachers, principals, and schools. But this is not true. What you're measuring when you use a standardized test is the family income of the students. Affluent suburbs have high scoring schools. Poor communities have low scoring schools. If you look at the results of whether it's the ACT or the SAT or any test in the world, including the, the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the te test scores of wealthiest kids are at the top and the test scores of the poorest kids bottom. Now, there, there are always exceptions. There are wealthy kids who are not too bright and have low scores. <laughs> and there are some poor kids who just are phenomenal and outperform and so on. But they're the outliers. The reality is every standardized test in the world is highly correlated with family income and family wealth. There are other reasons not to put so much emphasis on tests. Uh, as I learned from my seven years on the National Assessment Governing Board, which is the board that oversees the NAEP, uh, tests have flaws, they have statistical errors, uh, there are errors in the scoring. The only thing that's standard is best about them is when they're run through a computer to score them, but the questions are, are not standardized. They're, these are social constructions, they're human devices. Uh, one of my jobs on the NAEP board was to read questions, and I can't tell you how many times I would stop and say, wait a minute, there are two answers here that are correct. Or, wait a minute, I don't see a correct answer here. And these were questions that had been reviewed again and again by professional pals, and I would stop and everyone would look at the question again and say, you're right, there are two right answers. There's no right answer. And yet we're going to determine children's lives based on on these flawed instruments. Another thing you should understand about tests is we are the only nation in the world that I'm aware of that tests every child up here. Most other nations test children, and they call it grade span testing, where they have one test in elementary school, one test in junior high school, or middle school, one test in high school. Uh, and then one, as I'm sure Ozzy told you, uh, it's a, school is a standardized testing free zone. They don't have standardized testing. And, you know, miracle of miracles, it doesn't make any difference. Their performance is very high in the international test uh, because having standardized tests doesn't make anyone smarter. My guess is that it is just a kind of conformist thinking uh, that's antithetical to what we want in our schools. The most important use of tests, each standardized test, is diagnostic. Uh, but we're not using them to evaluate and measure and rank and rate and label and tell children they're failing, tell teachers they're no good. That is not the purpose or the, the uh, value of testing. Some politicians think that if you test students more frequently, they'll get smarter. <laughs> but 
But if you have a fever, you won't cure it by, by your temperature more frequently. <laughs> And if you're overweight, I promise you will not lose weight on the major bus. But we I hear politicians all the time saying we need more tests and more tests, but schools are too low and it's a waste of money. The other thing, another thing you should know about the test on these, these standardized tests is that the passing mark is set by human beings, and it's a judgment call. Sometimes they set the mark too high, sometimes they set it too low, sometimes they set it for political reasons. They may decide that they want uh, the state or whatever district it is to look good, and so they set a very low passing mark. Uh, but if they want, if someone's starting, uh, let's say a superintendent starting afresh, he may want to have a very high passing mark so that the kids see, be smarter the next year when he lowers it. <laughs> Uh, test scores, passing marks, are not science. They have no scientific basis behind them. And the other thing that's astonishing about the standardized testing industry today is that they do include written responses and they are evaluated either by computers, as huge problems. I mean, there are people who devote their professional lives down showing what nonsense that is, because computers can't identify error. They can identify grammatical error but not a factual error. So if you were to write in, in one of your written responses that the Civil War took place in uh, 1912, the computer wouldn't know that that was not right, and it would pass right over that, whereas a human score uh, would know differently. The other thing is that these written responses on standardized tests are now being graded by people hired from Craigslist and being paid $11 an hour, and they're necessarily educated. They just have, usually have to have a bachelor's degree of any kind, uh, and they're paid by how fast they can for these tests. Um, it's piecework, and it's very unfair to the uh, children because um, they're, they're locked to pinch when judgment's made as a snap judgment. Well, race at the top has been a monumental failure. Billions of dollars have been wasted. States that fund the grant, uh, like yours, uh, and like Washington and New York ended up spending more than the amount of the grant. Uh, New York won $700 million, but it spent far more than that to comply with mandates. Uh, one of our district superintendents set a study and found that uh, six of his uh, community districts had received had uh, received $11,000, and in order to meet the mandates, had to spend $400,000. Well, this is practically bankrupting the, the uh, less favored districts. So there's very little to show for it. Nothing in Race to the Top was based on evidence or experience. States were told that they're cast on charter schools, and yet we don't have any search base that tells us that charter schools, privately managed charter schools, are necessarily better than public schools. Uh, what we have in the rest of the country, I get we've got some good charter schools in Hawaii where kids get a Hawaiian immersion, which is fine. What, what's happening in the rest of the country, though, is that uh, the charter school is, have, charter schools have become an industry. And there are chains that have 100 schools and or 150 schools in different communities. And it's really hard for me to understand why communities should give up their school to a corporate charter chain. Uh, and the, the schools that boast the most, charter schools that boast about their higher test scores, usually exclude children with disabilities and are, are being sued in various jurisdictions for doing so, and usually exclude children who are English language learners. Well, we're supposed to believe that charter schools are going to teach public schools a lesson, but public schools can't exclude children with disabilities. That's illegal as well as unethical. They can't exclude English language learners. They have to take all children, and the charter schools don't. And charter schools have discipline codes that allow them to exclude children because of behavior problems, and they get, got, they get kicked right back to the public schools. So I see them as being not a step forward, but a step in the wrong direction. Now, a second thing that you had to do in order to receive this race of top funding 
was to have college and career ready standards, uh, which we all understood were the common core. Uh, and at that time, Race to the Top was announced in 2009. The common core standards had not even been written. Some states signed on to them sight unseen. They were never field tested to see what effects they would have on real children in real classrooms. Now, the third thing the states had to do to be eligible to get Race to the Top funding was to agree to create longitudinal data systems with personal identifiable information. Those systems have now become the target of corporations that want to mine children's data in order to develop new products and sell to back to schools. Uh, there has been an ongoing fight over children's privacy because of the government's new thirst to collect plaintiff-viable data, which frankly I, I don't see the value of uh, other than to any of these uh, entrepreneurs who, who are thinking of ways to use it and exploit it. Another thing that the states had to do, the fourth thing was to agree to close or turn around low performing schools. This too has been failure. Uh, schools are identified as failing mostly because of the children they serve. So in the inner city where children are poor, where the racial is segregated, where there are clusters of children with, with severe handicaps, they're considered failing schools. And instead of supporting these schools and improving them, the reformers say close them or turn them over to the state. And we know from research that stability and trust are necessary for real change to take place in a school. And yet the reformers have a light of, of stability and trust and gone, their, their strategy is disruption and chaos. Well, the most harmful aspect of Race to the Top was its insistence that states had built statewide teacher evaluation systems that reflected the rise or fall of student test scores. And so today, many states face 50% of teachers' ratings on test scores. Uh, this me method is known as BAM, value-added measurement, value-added modeling. It's junk science. It's junk science. <laughs> it treats standardized tests as reliable, scientific, and objective instruments, which they are not. Its ratings are unstable and invalid. A teacher may be highly effective one year and slip down to uh, developing or less effective the next year and then and go back and forth. And so when uh, the states are giving out merit pay, for instance, instance, you may have a teacher who has a high evaluation score in reading, a low evaluation score in math, and you're, they're left with the dilemma of giving a bonus to the teacher at the same time that they farm. <laughs> Well, another problem is that 70% of teachers do not teach the tested subjects of reading and math in grades 3 through 8. So some states have spent millions and millions of dollars creating more tests for every subject, and others resorted to what is now called attributed ratings, meaning the teachers were rated based on the scores of students they never taught and subjects they never taught. So you might have the art teacher evaluated, she would have to flip a coin and decide whether she wants to be evaluated by the reading scores and the math scores and hope she picked right. And so you have people in non-tested subjects being judged by who of other teachers and judged by students they never taught. It's insane. It actually was litigated in Florida and the judge in Florida said it may be unfair but it's not unconstitutional. <laughs> Uh, now, the Gates Foundation has been a major player in all of this. Uh, it totally funded Common Core Standards. It funded its uh, development, its implementation, its evaluation. Uh, it's funded almost every think tank and, and both teachers' unions and uh, everyone else's, and every national educational organization to promote Common Core Standards. But the Gates Foundation was also a huge player and pro uh, promoting the evaluation of teachers by test scores. Uh, the Gates Foundation will lead through videos and through test scores. And they have thousands and thousands of hours of good teachers and uh, teachers supposed to watch those videos to learn how to become a good teacher. Uh, I, I think I could watch a great orchestra conductor or symphony conductor for hours and hours, and I still wouldn't be a good symphony conductor. <laughs> that's, that's not the way it works. But the Gates Foundation gave hundreds of millions of dollars to four districts to prove this thesis. 
and it didn't work in any of them. Uh, in Tampa, Florida, Gates gave Tampa $100 million, but the project cost two, over $250 million, which the district had to exhaust its reserve funds in order to pay the cost of this teacher evaluation project. And Gates pulled out after putting in $80 million because he said they were not faithfully replicating whatever it was the foundation wanted. And Tampa has since been to the entire Gates teacher evaluation program and is trying to develop yet another one. Uh, it's just a mess that them, uh, as I described it, has anywhere. And the, uh, in 2014, the American Statistical Association warned that them was ineffective as a way of measuring uh, the quality of individual teachers. Te they, the American Statistical Association said that teachers account for between 1 and 14 percent of test score variations. And the rest is made up of family influence, student motivation, and other factors beyond the teacher's control. Well, the greatest crime committed by the reformers has been their unrelenting attacks on teachers. Secretary Duncan led the attack, and he was joined by Michelle Reed, by Joel Klein, by Bill Gates, and by a pack of others who called themselves reformers. There is simply no way to improve the schools while belittling, demeaning, and degrading the teaching profession. <laughs> As a result of the past six years of assaults against the teaching profession, there are teaching shortages across the nation. Teacher educational programs report sharply declining enrollments, and many states, especially red states, have taken advantage of the low esteem of teachers in public schools to slash their school's budget, to eliminate tenure and collective bargaining, and to eliminate any pay increases for advanced degrees. What industry would systematically undermine the worth of the professionals on whom they rely? It makes no sense at all. Why would they want to replace professionals with amateurs? That makes no sense. And yet, what, that's what's going on in many states. Uh, Florida adopted what is probably the stupidest bill in the country. It's in the uh, and that was to give the $10,000 bonus to people who want to be teachers based on their SAT score. Now, now think about it. People who want to be teachers took their SAT score five years earlier. And yet, they are, they will be given a bonus by the state of Florida as they arrive, whereas experienced teachers can't get the bonus unless they can somehow dig out their SAT score and they have to have a highly effective rate. So it's a, uh, Various people, including members of the Florida legislature, said this was one of the stupidest laws they ever passed. <laughs> the main achievement of the reformers was to introduce disruption and chaos into the lives of schools and professionals. By federal decree, teachers are required to pay more attention to test scores than to the needs and the interests of their students. And the Common Core standards have been an integral part of the disruption tactics. Common Core was supposed to change everything, to change testing, and textbooks, teacher education, and teacher evaluation, and everything else, and professional development. The standards, as I said before, were adopted by the states without ever being tested in a real classroom. No one knew how they would work. No one knew if they would work. No one knew what would happen once they were adopted. And yet, corporate America, the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, many other foundations, politicians, and many others repeated the false claims that the Common Core was necessary because it would make us globally competitive. How did they know? There was no evidence that it never existed before. No active classroom teachers were part of the writing committee for the Common Core. No early childhood educators. No one who was trained in special education. And so the standards worked on the assumption that every student would make the same progress if exposed to the same standards. And at the end of 12 years of schooling, everybody would be equal. There would be no achievement gaps. This was a kind of utopian idea. But it's not true anywhere. In states that had strong standards for a long time, like Massachusetts, there were still achievement gaps students, even when they're in the same schools 
with the same teachers and the same standards. Children are not clay that can be shaped at will. Each one is unique. Hundreds of early childhood educators tested the Common Core standards in K through three, said they were developmentally inappropriate. Suddenly, kindergarten became first grade, and children are expected to learn to read before they turn first grade. Uh, that's not, never been true until now. Children learn to read at different times at different rates, and it does, by the time they're seven or eight years old, it hardly matters. Teachers with special education have tested the, the standards assumption that old children learn at the same rate, but the standards are copyrighted. They can't be changed. The standards requirement more time to devoted to informational text than to literature, a 50-50 split in K through six and a 30-70 split in high school favoring informational text has no basis for research or evidence. Uh, people who wrote that requirement were simply taking the assessment directions from the NAEP, which were not written to teachers but were written for people developing assessments. Now, what you probably know is that most of the people on the Common Core Writing Committee came from either SAT, ACT, or other testing companies. And so that's why you have something called close reading. Uh, because that's preparing children to take excerpts and read them on standardized tests. Uh, but what we've seen in the past five years, because of this emphasis on informational text, is that the reading of literature in American public schools has declined significantly. And I'm not opposed to reading informational text. I write it every day. <laughs> that, I love informational text, but frankly, I don't think the federal government should be telling anybody uh, any English teacher, how much time to devote to informational text and how much time to devote to literature, that should be the teacher's decision. Yeah. The tests aligned to the Common Core were even more problematic than the standards. Marty Duncan paid out $360 million to create two tests, the PARC and the Smarter Balance Assessment. And I personally think that um, he didn't have the authority to do that because the law says very clearly that no federal government official is allowed to uh, influence or, or in, interfere in any way with attempt, attempt to control curriculum or instruction. And Secretary Duncan said that just by funding tests, that didn't affect either curriculum or instruction. <laughs> uh, but we all know that the tests are what define curriculum and instruction and drive them. As the tests have been implemented, teachers and parents have complained that the tests are far above the grade level of the children. When the results have been published in state after state, every state discovered that the majority of their students failed to meet the proficient standard. The designers of the assessments decided to align their cut score and passing marks with NAEP proficient. NAEP proficient is an achievement level and it's a very high achievement level. I considered NAEP proficient to be an A. This was a really bad decision. Only about, on the NAEP, only about 30 to 35% of students typically reach this mark. There's only one state in the country, Massachusetts, has ever had as many as 50% of its students reach NAEP proficient. So that meant that in every other state but Massachusetts, uh, the majority of students were expected to fail. I don't know why the federal government would want a majority of students to tell their failures. So in New York, for example, 70% of the students across the state failed the Common Core test. 97% of English language learners fail. 95% of students with disabilities fail. More than 80% of black and Hispanic students fail. Those who set the passing mark knew this in advance. Uh, our state commissioner of education at the time was John King. He's now the new secretary of education. He said before the test was even given that 70% of the kids would fail. How did he know? Well, he knew what the passing mark was, and he knew that it was set to fail 70% of the children. Why did these people think it was such a good idea to tell little kids in grades 3 through 8 that they were failures? So the punitive nature of these tests inspired a massive opt-out movement, and it was the largest and most powerful in New York State. For about 20% of the students in the state refused to take the test last spring. That's about 240,000 students. Politicians pay attention. Politicians pay attention when you have that much 
grassroots activity saying, don't do this to my children. In the politically powerful suburbs of Long Island, nearly half the students opted out, and many more opted out in other states such as Colorado. Now, some of the reformers who had created this monstrosity hoped that the dismal results of these tests would lead us to a stampede to charter schools. But most charter schools actually perform no better than public schools on the common core test. And just at the point where large and growing numbers of parents became totally disgusted with the overwhelming number of tests and disgusted that their children's teachers were being evaluated by the test scores, Congress decided it was time to replace NCLB at last, to rein in the Secretary of Education at last. So now we have a new federal law. It's called the Every Student Succeeds Act. This is the obverse of No Child Left Behind. Take your choice. No child left behind or every student succeeds. It says the same thing. Uh, but frankly, it is bizarre to project that a federal law has the power to make every student succeed or to leave no child behind. Uh, but this seems to be the fashion in Congress these days is to give a legislation uh, wishful, wishful titles. Uh, it's time to recall the original purpose of federal law and by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It was passed as part of Lennon B. Johnson's War on Poverty. Its purpose was not raising test scores. Its purpose was to send money to schools that needed money, with the schools where the poor kids were. The original Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which has been reauthorized and changed many times, did not have testing and accountability as its focus. Now, the new, the new federal law, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, does not abandon testing and accountability, but it shifts the responsibility for it from the federal government to the states. States that want to cut back on testing can do so, but they're still required to test every child every year. ESSA removes the federal punishments and leaves it to the states to determine whether teachers and principals and schools will be punished for not getting high test scores. And like No Child Left Behind, the SSA has a cap on the percent of students with disabilities who are able to get an exemption from the standard test. Frankly, I don't understand that. It would seem to me that some states have, might have more students eligible than others, but nonetheless, there is, there is a cap. They're afraid that the kids might get an accommodation. In other words, SSA gives states the power to redesign the testing and accountability system of NCLB, but not to avoid it. It's still firmly rooted in the errors of No Child Left Behind. In states with a governor and a legislature who understand that children are more than a score, there is the possibility of real change in the worst excesses of the past 15 years. In states where the governor and the legislature want to continue humiliating teachers and testing children until they cry, and creating a free market of schools, nothing will change that might get worse. The good thing about ESSA is that it shifts the responsibility for school reform to the states where citizens have a chance to be heard. Most people know their elected representatives and can push them to do the right thing. Most, when, when all the control was in Washington, what the federal control was literally stifling diversity and innovation and Congress never heard the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of ordinary citizens who were sick and tired of all the testing and punishments. The saddest part of all this is that we have lived through 15 years of misguided policies that hurt children, stifle creativity, and demand conformity. Our society's saving grace lies not in test scores, but in the school's ability to develop good character to develop good citizenship and to stimulate creativity, originality, tinkering around, curiosity, imagination, wonder, and a love of learning. NCLB and Race to the Top try to shovel all our children into the same narrow mold. Good riddance to them both. <laughs> Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan once famously said when touring a classroom, I want to be able to look at the, into the eyes of a second grader and know that that child is on track to go to college. I don't agree.
When I look at the eyes of a child in second grade, I want to see if that child is healthy, well-nourished, happy, actively engaged in learning, and eager to learn more. I would be horrified to find that that child is thinking about college. <laughs> things go wrong, you can't blame Washington. You already can't blame Washington, why not? I think the public it still has this obsession with uh, data and, and testing and accountability. But you are now responsible for valuing your teachers, improving your schools, and ensuring that every child arrives in school healthy and ready to learn. Thank you very much.
Uh, look for all of those openings. Uh, the major, most important thing you need to do is to have a different mindset about what, school, what schools are supposed to do, what your ambitions are for the schools, what your hopes are, what your vision is. And you have to have a vision based on the idea of human development and the development of potential of every child. And if you have that vision, you will realize the test scores can't help you there. Uh, you're, again, you're measuring family wealth and family income, and you don't need to spend millions of dollars on standardized tests. You can just ask people, what's your income? <laughs> But I think you're, the most important thing is to have a vision of what's the education that you would want for your child and what is a, a, a kind of education that is going to inspire creativity, uh, a work ethic, uh, a self-belief, self-concept uh, self where children feel empowered to, uh, to try and be and do things. Uh, but you have to think that kind of education as opposed to what, what we're sort of in in case you know, spoiled thinking, thinking that has proven to be wrong, thinking that has led us nowhere, thinking that has discouraged and moralized teachers to make parents angry. So we have to somehow break free of all these bad ideas and get back to what matters most, which is the well-being of children, uh, a, a, having experienced teachers who are trusted by the community and who know how to work together as a team. And we have to think about a model of school that's based on collaboration and not competition. Thank you very much.